Welcome, welcome. Hello, guys. Are you ready? Hello, hello, good evening. Hi, Virginia, how are you? Hello, Virginia, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Virginia, are you there? Yes. Hey, how are you? What's going on? Are you I'm ready? good. Thank you. I'm trying to connect with my computer, so. Oh, okay. Okay, that's cool. I can hear you that well, so. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right, excellent. Uh, tell me on what section are you on on the platform? Um, and I'm in the listening practice. Uh, in what section? Types of questions, listening section, listening practice, which one? Uh, just one second. Oh, um, I mean, I'm looking what you are looking. So just one second. Okay. Um, I stopped sharing my screen. Okay, I'm trying to um, get in the platform. Okay, don't worry. Just relax. Okay. I'm at detail questions in the part of the detailed questions I already oh. okay so let's go ahead and get into the detailed questions uh, were you able to finish that section or yes I finish it okay so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the listening practice okay and we are going to be looking at see detailed questions that's done can you see my screen Yes. All right. So right now we're going to look at the gist and gist purpose questions. Uh, the objective of this activity is to be able to identify gist questions. Uh, instructions, listen to part of a lecture from a history class. So we're going to listen to this audio and then we're going to go ahead and answer the questions. Are you ready? Yes. It's six of them. Uh, I would like, do you have a pen and paper available so that you can take notes? Yes, I have. Okay. So what I would like for you to do is as you listen to the audio, uh, I want you to write down any questions that you have referring to context, referring to uh, vocabulary, referring to pronunciation and things of that nature. Okay. Let's, let's get started. Okay. Listen to part of a lecture from a history class. William Cody. Well, you probably know him as Buffalo Bill. Okay, so William Cody became an American showman and founded the Great Wild West Show. That was in 1883. He traveled around Europe with other famous people that you probably have also heard of, like people such as the sharpshooter Annie Oakley and the Indian chief Sitting Bull. 
This Wild West show traveled, as I said, around Europe and performed for many heads of state, like the Queen of England. Queen Victoria, the show was featured at her Golden Jubilee celebrations, and the Tsar of Russia. That would have been the Tsar, uh, Alexander III. His father, Alexander II, had been assassinated in 1881, so Alexander III would have seen Cody's show. 4. What is the talk mainly about? All right, would you like me to play the audio one more time, Virginia? No, that's okay. I'm going to see the questions. Okay, let's look at the first one. What is the talk mainly about? About, oh, I already done that. It's about the... Oh, you did this one already? The, yes. Oh, okay. So we'll just uh, review real fast. What is the talk mainly about? Buffalo Bills Wild yeah, Wild. Yeah, Buffalo Bills Wild Wild. Yeah. All right. And number two, what does the speaker mainly discuss? I just ragtime in America. The second one is ragtime. Yeah. B. It's ragtime. a rhythm. Yeah. B. All right. So the other one is another listening. Did you do the other section? Yes. Okay. Why does the professor say this? Mm, it's D. D is correct to get the students to consider the question more deeply. Number four, why does the professor say this? Um, it's because the, they were unfamiliar with, with the, that word, that's with the right. meaning of the word. That's right, to define a word that might be unfamiliar. Number six, why does the professor say this? Um, to, give, um, to give her the approval, letter C? Letter C or letter D, to direct the students to consider another interpretation? A letter D. Letter D is correct. Number six, why does the professor say this? Um, letter C, to give her, her, to give her approval. That is correct, to give her approval of the Orc Climbing Workshop Leader. Um, do you have any questions referring to the vocabulary or the pronunciation of this information? Yes. Do you have any questions about that? Yes. What does mean um, Orc Climbing Workshop Leader? Orc Climbing Workshop, let me see. Orc Climbing Workshop Leaders, Orc Climbing. Mm. Very good question. Let's look that up. O R C K or climbing. I'm I'm imagining that it's a special technique of climbing or rock climbing. There it is. Or oh, it's rock. It's rock. It's misspelled. It's rock climbing. Yeah. Yeah. It's misspelled. Let me uh, go ahead and take a a screenshot of this so that I can report it to. Uh, technical support and we can have this fixed one second or climb there it is okay I'll go ahead and I'll report this to the technical the technical support department so that they can go ahead and fix it for us all right have you done the detailed questions section Yes, they have. You did that? Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and skip that one then. All right, listening practice test. Have you done the practice test? No, I haven't. Okay, go ahead and complete the practice test and then we will check it together and I will give you any observations you may have. Go ahead.
Oh, well, I noticed that we have uh, Julia. Mm -hmm. Julia is in the class. Hi, Julia. Hello, Nidia. Hello, teacher. Um, hi, Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi, Nidia. Hi. Hi, uh, how are you? Very good. Welcome to the class, ladies. At this Thank you. Thank you're you. welcome. You're welcome. At this moment, what we are doing is working on section number listening practice test one, TOEFL section one, TOEFL module one. So I would like for you guys to do the practice test. You're going to listen to the audio scripts and then you will answer the questions. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. All right. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to work on it. You can help each other and then we will check it together. Okay. Ready? Go. Are we just a group? Yes, you can work as a group. Okay, Virgi thank you. Vir Virginia, Julia, and Nidia. Work as a trio. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Listening practice test one. Instructions. Listen to part of a lecture in a business studies class. Okay. Okay. Hey, sorry about that. Uh, I just need one minute, please. Okay. So we've outlined a number of techniques for effective decision making. Now let's focus on one approach to listen to a part of a lecture in a business studies class. Okay, so we've outlined a number of techniques for effective. Is this, I, I hear a, a back. Uh, sound? Can we play? Sorry? Okay. I play the decision making. Uh, now let's focus on one approach to figuring out how to uh, make good business decisions. Okay. So, uh, one way of deciding whether to go ahead with some new investment project is to perform what's known as CBA, or cost-benefit analysis. CBA can estimate and total up the money values of both the benefits and costs to a community, institution, or business to establish whether an investment choice is worthwhile. So let's assume you've generated solutions to a business problem and have thought really carefully about which way to go. You think you have the best solution available, but before going ahead with any investment decision, what you need to do is add up the value of the benefits as well as the costs of this action. Now, uh, what I mean by costs and benefits here is always, it's, it's always expressed in monetary terms. So, um, we find out what the cost is in money terms and also what the benefits might be also in money terms. Then we subtract the costs from the benefits and we can choose whether to go ahead or not. All right, in simple terms, costs tend to be what we spend on something. Um, say for example, a new piece of machinery and, uh, and benefits are uh, what advantages expressed in money units we get over the lifetime of that machinery because of having purchased it as opposed to, well, not having it or having some alternative. Um, in, in such a case, we can figure out a fairly simple CBA just by looking at expenses and uh, then subtracting them from the savings brought about by uh, improved, uh, the improvements of introducing the machinery. That would include things like the savings met by not having to pay salaries to employees who previously did the work of the machine. We could add the fact that the machines make fewer mistakes, <laughs> we hope, than human employees. So
so there will be fewer rejected products. But on the other hand, we have to factor in the cost of running the machines, uh, such as maybe the increased electricity bill, the cost of repairs, and of course, the cost of training someone to operate the new equipment. So that much is pretty straightforward. But we also have to think about less tangible, less visible costs and benefits. Cost benefit analysis really only works if we're careful to add in all the costs and benefits. Uh, costs especially are sometimes hidden. For example, in, in paying for this new stuff, we're taking liquid money and spending it, right? So we're no longer paid interest for having that money in a bank or otherwise invested. Okay, so we have to subtract that loss from the benefit side. Then suppose also that the new machines are noisy. That means soundproofing, that's a cost. Or, or will it take up more space than the replaced workers and therefore require an addition to the building? These are less obvious costs, but they should be factored in to get an accurate picture. When we do CBA in a more public domain, uh, say on the building of a new road, the calculations can become even more tricky. Although there's some impressive software nowadays that helps us out, of course. So, how do we measure the benefits here? Does the road improve or worsen people's lives? A new road may, for example, uh, damage some wildlife habitat, or some residential community may be inconvenienced by the noise or air pollution. On the other hand, the new road could improve property values by decreasing commuting times. Uh, it could also save human lives, since it's safer than the old road. In practice, CBA tries to put a value on all these things, although a lot of people may not like what it says. What it does is try to find out how people really value these apparently subjective things by looking at the financial choices they're prepared to make to gain a benefit or to avoid something on the cost side. In this way, we can put a monetary figure on all benefits and costs. Of course, these calculations can be complex and sometimes controversial. But I want to point out that CBA is a powerful tool and perhaps the most rational way of choosing whether to go ahead with a complex investment decision. Okay. All right, let's check it out. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so we're gonna look at the first section. It says, what is the lecture mainly about? Who can tell me what is the lecture mainly about? <laughs> yeah, it's so difficult. <laughs> Do you want me to play it again one more time? It's A, a method for evaluating outcomes. Very good. A method yes. for evaluating outcomes is correct. Who can do number two for me? Why does the professor mention the instruction of machinery? To help explain how costs and benefits are worked out. That is correct. To help explain how costs and benefits are worked out. Number three, why does the professor say this? Let's listen. So that much is pretty straightforward. But we also have to think about less tangible, less visible costs and benefits. So why does the professor say this? She thinks some costs are difficult to, to see. She doesn't 
she does not think the analysis is complicated? She yes, wants... because there are some tasks that uh, people don't think about. Okay, let's check. It's let's... Uh, letter A. Letter A. Okay. That was number three, right? Yes. Hmm. For some reason, it doesn't. It doesn't throw me the answer. Okay. She she mentioned some calls that, like, usually people don't doesn't consider. So that's mm -hmm. why I think it's that answer. Okay, she does not think the analysis is complicated. Yeah, because she says, uh, she said that, that you have to look at feasible costs, tangible costs. So that means that these are things that you have to be able to touch. And what about number four? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Why does the professor say this? Number four, let's listen. When we do CBA in a more public domain, uh, say on the building of a new road, the calculations can become even more tricky. Although there's some impressive software nowadays that helps us out, of course. Why does the professor say this? Say on the building of a new road, Let it. What is your answer? Letter? Letter A. Letter A, to verify how tricky it is to apply CBA to a transportation business. Okay. Okay, the next one is for, according to the professor, how does CBA evaluate subject, subjective things? Subjective cost from benefit. Very good. It says right here, by studying how people use money, letter B. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Now we're going to look at six. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Why does the professor say this? A, to show how experts are biased. B, to explain why the website is bad. C, to encourage the student to visit the professor. D, to indicate that she needs to pay attention to other details. What is your answer? What is the meaning of the word base? Biased. 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 Uh, the meaning of the word biased is when somebody has a premeditated opinion about something or somebody. For example, for example, um, imagine that I, okay, I was raised in Houston, Texas. So I know a lot of history about Texas. So something biased that the American people have is that whenever they see, or black people, for example, it, they say, all black people eat fried chicken. That's a biased opinion. That's a prejudged mental opinion because you don't know this person. Prejudice, Prejudice opinion. Maybe this person doesn't even like chicken. Or oh. imagine, or imagine that you have a group of Americans and they say, all Salvadoreños 
are frijoleros. They eat beans. That's a biased opinion because not all Salvadorians eat beans. Right? So a biased opinion is when somebody has a prejudgmental uh, opinion or idea of a group of people without knowing those people. Thanks. You understand? Yes, I did. It's like some people say, oh, uh, this person has tattoos. He's a gang member. Yeah. And the guy is maybe not even a gang member. He maybe only likes art. He could be a businessman. But he has tattoos. Oh, he's a gang member. That's a biased opinion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's continue. So the answer for number six is A, B, C, or D. Who can tell me the answer? Um, Who can tell me the answer? A, B, C, or D? Letter D. Letter D. To indicate that she needs to pay attention to other details. Hello, Evelyn Hovell, welcome. Hello, Robert, welcome. We are working, we are working from the practice test. The practice test. Number one, Number listening. One. All right, number seven. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Why does the professor say this? That's weird, it doesn't give me the answer. I think it's this one probably. 7-Eleven, is that what it is? But it has the university address of a professor. Isn't it okay to use sites with the .edu domain in the address? Well, you have to look beyond just the address. Yes, you are correct that this site is that of a professor, a professor at a very prestigious university, in fact. Why does the professor say this? Well, you have to look beyond just the address. Okay. So seven is letter? A. A, A. to encourage the student to investigate the claims further. Number eight. What is the lecture mainly about? Listen, please. So, now I'd like to focus on the Prairie School of Architecture, which developed the most significant architectural style in North America in the first decades of the 20th century. The main influences on this style came from several places. For example, the philosophy and practice of the architect Louis Sullivan. Now, you may remember that Sullivan liked to say that form follows function. In other words, the shape and structure of a building should follow, should, should depend on the purpose, the intended use of the building. There was also the English arts and crafts movement. That was important around this time, too. That was a second important influence. And I should mention traditional Oriental themes, which also played an important part in the Prairie School ideas. Now, the students and followers of Sullivan, the most famous of whom was Frank Lloyd Wright, developed these themes and ideas into a truly American style, a style expressing a belief in the unity of mankind and nature. Now, 
When people think of architecture, they, they often think of large public buildings. But most of the effort of the Prairie School was devoted to domestic buildings, mainly houses for well-to-do private citizens. So, can anyone here describe to me any of the important features of Prairie School houses? Didn't they mostly have long horizontal lines rather than a vertical appearance? Yes, yes, they did. That's certainly part of it. We can say that the most visible external features of this architecture were horizontal lines and heavy roofs projecting away from the walls. The shapes were designed to both harmonize with and reflect the broad, flat prairies of the Midwestern United States. But somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas, especially in the Chicago suburbs, rather than on the prairies themselves. Okay, now, what about the insides, the interiors? Didn't they want to do away with small rooms? Well, in a sense, yes. Um, there was certainly an emphasis on keeping the number of separate rooms to a minimum, um, opening up living space, and uh, designing internal walls so that the light and view created a sense of unity. The idea was to reduce the number of interior corners typical of traditional European houses. See, Prairie School architects thought of this, of this traditional home as confining, both physically and, and also spiritually. So, by ridding the inside of houses of, of so many rooms and corners and walls, they hoped to create a feeling of, of movement and freedom. Their ideal of beauty was to try to make the living space more compatible with human proportions and living requirements. Often, large fireplaces were built at the center of the overall design rather than attached to an outside wall. And this gave additional structural support to the building, so it further allowed the building to get by with fewer interior walls. Now, let me add that in line with their belief in the importance of nature, these architects related the interiors to the surrounding natural landscape by their use of windows that were continuous ribbons of glass. So, in that way, the outside and inside of the houses were more closely related. Other ways they suggested the importance of nature were in designing terraces projecting from the external walls with parapets, walls that were used as as planting boxes for flowers and shrubs, and deep roof overhangs that led the eye toward the horizon. Of course, not all prairie school houses had all these features, but certainly we can say that there was a general tendency among these architects to provide their designs with many of them. Okay, so now we've discussed overall structure. Now what about ornamentation? Uh... Didn't they reject almost all decorative elements? Well, not entirely. Although it's true they like to keep things simple. Again, this was in line with their opposition to what they perceived as, as the fussiness of more traditional housing styles. We can say that ornamentation was only permitted if it, if it complemented, if it, if it blended in with the overall expression and feeling of the building. So... To this end, the Prairie School architects tended to use simple, unmixed, natural materials, sometimes with geometric or oriental designs. For example, many of the prairie houses had a turned-up roof edge, reminiscent of traditional Japanese houses. Okay, so finally, I'd like to mention that these architects usually designed all the furniture that went with each house. Each piece of furniture, whether built-in or freestanding, was carefully crafted to fit in with the overall feeling of the house. Again, natural materials were preferred and restful horizontal lines were emphasized. So that was kind of like a real long uh, listening audio. 
Uh, I, but as you can see, the audios are broken down on the exercise. So we're going to go one by one. The first one says, what is the lecture mainly about? Who can tell me? Letter C. Letter C is correct. The Priory School of Architecture is correct. Very good. Thank you. Who can give me the answer for nine? What can be said about the nature of prairie school architecture? It says here A, B, A, C, C, B, D, and D, B, C. It, this is talking about uh, the first skyscrapers in America, mm -hmm. the influence of the English cards. Who can tell me what is what is the what is the the nature of Prairie School? A and C. The first square. A and C. That's right, Roberto. Very good, Roberto. That is correct. A and C, referring to the first skyscraper in America and the Priory School of Architecture. Uh, number 10, according to the professor, how did Prairie School architects make a living space more compatible with human needs? That would be the influence of the English arts crafts movements, right? And D, which is oriental motives in American architecture. Okay. That would be the correct answer for number 10, B and D. All right, so here we can see that it's already breaking down. So we are going to listen to this one together. I'm going to close all these audio tracks. All right, let's go to the next one. The shapes were designed to both harmonize with and reflect the broad, flat prairies of the Midwestern United States. But somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas, especially in the Chicago suburbs, rather than on the prairies themselves. Why does the professor say this? Somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas, All right, so it says, listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question, why does the professor say this? What is your answer? To introduce a new discussion topic for the lecture, to suggest that the name of the school is slightly inappropriate to find out whether the students have understood the concept of prairie, to express disagreement with the stated aims of the prairie school architects. Letter B. Letter B is correct to suggest that the name of the school is slightly inappropriate. Who can tell me what is the meaning of the word slightly? Like just for, just for a bit, just uh, a little. That is correct, just a little bit. Just a little bit, that means slightly. 
number 12. Let's listen. Okay, now I'd like to present an idea that has recently become much talked about in the fields of biology and psychology, and also in studies of cultural transmission. I should point out that some of what this is is not fully accepted by some academics, but I'm bringing this up today just to, well, hopefully whet your appetite. Okay, now you're all familiar, of course, with the term gene and how it's considered as the unit of inheritance. As you know, we inherit our genes from our parents, and then we pass them on to our kids. What genes do is replicate. That is, they make copies of themselves. Some scientists even like to claim that animals and plants and all organisms are just essentially systems for the transmission of genes from one generation to the next. Now, sometimes genes make mistakes, and the mutant forms that result may make new life forms, at least if they succeed. If the environment in which they find themselves is suitable, they will succeed and thrive and reproduce. Now, of course, environments differ from place to place, and successful genes, which inhabit various organisms, themselves change the environment. The pressures of the changing environment lead to variation in the organisms, and this eventually creates the vast complexity of life. All right, so now I want to bring in here something that is kind of like a gene in the way it behaves. This thing is called a meme. Now, it's spelled M-E-M-E. -M -E. The term meme was invented by the zoologist Richard Dawkins, to refer to a unit of information in our minds which influences events so that copies of itself are passed on to other minds. Some people have described memes as patterns of information that spread, uh, just like viruses or, or bacteria, and which alter the behavior, even if in a very subtle, uh, very small, or hardly noticeable way, causing the host to pass on the pattern. In a sense, they're parasites, because they use us, or at least our brains, as a springboard for their transmission to other brains. The essential point is that a meme replicates. That is, it's, a, it's capable of imitation, just like a gene. A meme can be an idea, a song, a, a joke, a food recipe, or even a way of constructing bridges. How to make a fire could be considered another one. What is important here is that memes are imitated and thus passed on from one person to another. Also, they don't even have to be true. They just have to, in some way, make sense to us. Memes seem to come in all sizes. They can be as small as, say, a, a new slang term to very large. That is to say, a, a whole way of looking at the world say, a, a political ideology. Some people who write about memes would probably call such a large meme a meme complex, a whole set of memes clustered together for, as it were, mutual protection. All right, so the useful thing about this idea is that it enables us to explain certain things about behavior and even our physical makeup that are difficult to explain without it. At the most simple level, it helps us to understand why some ideas survive and some just drop out of sight. The memes that are transmitted are the survivors. And just as genes group together, so to speak, to form organisms that can reproduce, so memes may cluster together in human brains and pass on to other brains complex systems of thought, such as political ideas or even scientific theories. Now, if we ask why our minds always appear to be active and full of thoughts, we can answer using this meme idea, that it is because memes need to get repeated over and over in our heads. They need to be rehearsed and remembered if they're not thought about and transferred to another brain, they'll die out, disappear. So from the meme's point of view, 
it's necessary to be practiced, then passed on to another mind. According to some theorists in this field, the reason our minds are continually filling up with ideas is that the memes force us to. One person has even suggested that the human brain, with all its complexity, was in some way designed by memes in order to promote their own success. Furthermore, surprisingly, it's claimed that we ourselves are not the ones who benefit from our ideas. It's, you guessed it, the memes themselves. The self itself is a meme. In other words, at least some theorists seem to be saying, we are nothing but temporary groupings of memes that have come together in order to be protected and passed on to other minds in order that they can survive and prosper. Wow, that was a deep audio. Did you guys get that? Did you guys get what they're talking about? Yeah. Wow, that's super deep. Like a philosophy class. I still believe that Jesus, God made us. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't care what the scientists say. God made me. All right, let's look. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, let's look at number 12. What aspect of a meme's behavior does the professor mainly discuss? Who can tell me? Um, the tendency to be cop copied. Copy, that's right. It's the tendency to be copied. And if you think about it, if you think about it, what is the first thing that a businessman does when he wants to put up a business? Who can tell me? What does he do? The first. He copies the other businesses. Yeah. Who can tell me how who can tell me how Burger King became so rich, so popular, so successful? How? What happened? What did they do? What was their secret? Do a burger like better than the other one? Not really. They copied McDonald's. The, their marketing department, what they did was they would post in front of every McDonald's and then they would time the traffic of the clients coming in and out, in and out. So what did they do? They started building Burger Kings near McDonald's. Well, in El Salvador, it's a different, um, it's a different market. But in the United States, you can ask your relatives if, if you have family members in the States, wherever you see a McDonald's, you're going to see a Wendy's or a Burger King near or on the same street. Right. Yeah. So, so basically that's, that's what we do. We copy everything. We just, you know, we see somebody that's successful. We copy what they do. We want to, we fashion, we dress like the next person, or we're looking for the, the trending fashion. Why? Because everybody else is doing it. That's crazy. That's why we are made from news. 13. According to the professor, why did the Anazazi start making pottery who can tell me what is the meaning of pottery Where pottery uh, alfareria uh, sorry i couldn't hear you repeat pottery it's alfareria in espanol alfareria i don't know what that means in spanish it's where you put your it's, uh -huh. um it's where you Pardon. put it the food. Um, you can cook, cook in it. What do you make pottery from? You made it from mud. Well, it's you really not. It's a special type of mud. Uh, it's you can clay. Do it, uh, it's called clay. Yes, it's clay. That's the name. Okay, so pottery is better for keeping food. So 12 is it's the tendency to be copied. 13 is C, pottery is better for keeping food. Especially pupusas. Have you ever eaten pupusas made out of a, 
clay oven? Yes, I have. They are mm -hmm. cooked with its own fat, with its own grease, and they are much healthier. Is it called oven? No, no, those are called uh, clay ovens, clay mm -hmm. ovens. There's one here in El Salvador, I have seen one. It's a handcrafted uh, clay oven. It's over here by, do you know where it is Casa Presidencial? Yeah. But not the new one, not the one in Escalón. The old one, the one that's over there like going towards San Marcos. Yes. The big one? Yeah. The okay, so one. that's right. So in that area, there is a, uh, a restaurant that makes pupusas out of clay. I can't remember the name, but I, I have eaten there before. Uh, there, one, there is another one uh, by Redondel Mas Ferrer. On Redondel Mas Ferrer. Yes. That's, that's uh, near it, my house. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I think it's nearby the Selectos. Oh, really? I didn't know that. On the on the side on the side um, they have like side streets where they sell food. Is that is it yeah. there? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah, those pupusas are delicious. Yes. Also in El Volcan, in El Boquerón. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so there's many places I need to go. <laughs> Thank you so much for all this information, Miss Virginia. You're welcome. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and move on. Let's look at the next section. Uh, for the next section, what I would like for us to do, it, oh, it's the midterm. Midterm exam. Okay, guys, for the midterm exams, I really cannot help you. This is one of your metrics for this module. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys work on it individually. I will be here in case you have a question referring to vocabulary or how to write something on the platform, uh, but I really cannot get into too much as far as helping you out with the answers, okay? Okay. So go ahead, we have 10 more minutes and you can work on the platform, I'll be here with you. I'm gonna put you in pairs so that you guys can help each other. I'm gonna put you in pairs so you guys can help each other. And I will be monitoring the groups so that you can, you can ask me questions. If I'm not on your group monitoring and you have a question, just raise your hand and I will enter your group and I will help you. They don't see. Okay. Eh, Julia, Julia, no entró a la sesión pequeña. Ok, gracias, Julia. The meaning of uh, this was the essence of the text, right? Or the the listening. 
Which word? Uh, the word this is uh, the meaning the essence teacher. Yeah. That's what I think so. Yeah, okay. Seven three words which were used. I'm thinking about the words that are used in the inference, inference question. And I only know that they, they are not in the text. Okay. So I can remember what Most likely you will be able to find a synonym of that word in the text. Uh -huh. But in that case, you will have to analyze uh, the text that the, 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 the sorry the text that you're currently reading. Mm -hmm. Like ma major ideas will be no right. Mm. Okay, let me go ahead and check.
Okay. You mentioned it at this moment, uh, midterm test. Go ahead and check. Inference questions. For inference questions. All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, time is up. You can continue the midterm exam on your own time. And we will continue on Monday. If you have any questions, I'm going to be connected to the WhatsApp group. So I will be here to help. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Okay, guys. Have good evening. Nice weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Please, please. Hey. Stay home. Don't put yourself at risk. It's a quarantine. Take care, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Be good.